to win like that, I was on top of the cage and I was almost, it was, there was, I wasn't smiling. Even afterwards, everybody came in, I wasn't smiling. I was like pissed off. And I wasn't pissed off at anybody. I was more pissed off at like myself because it's like, you were so hard on yourself for all this time, for the past like 10 or 11 months, you were so hard on yourself. You were like, you, you didn't want to even go back to teach the kids striking class because you got knocked out, you know? And you, you were so self-conscious. I couldn't, dude, I couldn't even watch like UFC fights without thinking about like my loss. Mm. I see a guy get finished. I'm like, damn, that's like, what happened to me? You know? And, um, it was just, cause I was one of those casual MMA fans for a long time. You know, you see a guy get finished, like, oh man, that guy got worked, you know? But, um, I, so I was, I was angry afterwards really for a little bit. I was, I was like screaming out in the crowd. Like you got like thinking that they doubted me, but they didn't. It was really... What is up, everybody? It is your friendly neighborhood BJJ podcast from Rafa Sparks and coming to you with another great installment of The Grappling Hour. I hope that you're having a good day. We have a very good guest. Now, you may have seen earlier tonight that we did a fight companion uh, if you were watching on our YouTube. Now, this is going to be presented to you after the fact. Some of you are going to see us 30 days after and you're like, what a fight companion? Well, we did one for UFC Fight Pass Invitational 6. So if you want to see that, there is a link down below. You can kind of catch the highlights of it because it was actually not a bad card. And uh, we're very happy to see a lot of our friends do some incredible things. So I'm happy to have that going on. But before we get back to our guest, I want to give you guys a couple quick reminders here. First and foremost, if you like the show, head on over to rafasparza.com backslash merch. And if you go there, you can go ahead and get one of these t-shirts. You can get one of these hoodies. You can get all the good shit. Look at this. My man's already, he's already posing. Look at that. That's probably going to be the still from the show. I'm going <laughs> to like cut that one. But if you guys check that out, you can go on over rafasparza.com backslash merch or grapplinghour.com. If you go there, t-shirts, 25 bucks, multicolors starting to roll very low on stock, or you can go on over to get a hoodie, and the hoodies are 45 bucks. So the combination of the two, $60. If you also want to support the show and you want to see interviews like this or anybody else, you can go on over to patreon.com backslash grappling hour. If you go there for five bucks a month, you can see our interviews 30 days before anybody else. And for a few extra bucks, you can see tape studies where we watch fights with the athletes or jujitsu matches. You can also check out all the different things that we do for our mini sods and even a segment where people roast my competition footage called Roast Raff. I think that's a very fun one. So go check those things out. And if you want to continue the discussions we have here on the show, you can go on over to our Discord. It is at Grappling Hour. And be sure to like, comment, and subscribe. And if you don't know what you want to like, comment, or subscribe, <laughs> by the end of this video, we will give you a prompt at the very end of it. So stay tuned for that. All right. Our guest. You know what's very funny? is our guests and I, we've seen each other here and there. And I've been waiting to see what's going to happen next for this young man. When I saw him last, we were just getting in some incremental training, just saying hello, seeing how things were. I wasn't sure if this man was going to fight again. And yet he told me there's a possibility. We'll see. He's got a lot of stuff going on in his life, but I know at his soul, he is an excellent jiu-jitsu fighter. He is also an excellent MMA martial artist kind of a guy. And uh, nobody was happier than when I saw him put on his Instagram that he was going to be fighting at a Lights Out Fighting Organization event. And uh, to nobody's surprise, my man ended up back in the winner's circle. And I have to say, so proud to see good friend of the show, one, Eddie Bernal, back in the winner's circle. Eddie, how are you doing? Welcome back to the show, sir. Great. Thanks for having me, man. I really appreciate it. It was, uh, it was nice man, coming out with a W and, uh, it was nice getting invited to come back on the show. I love being on the show and, uh, yeah, it was a good showing and, um, I'm just going back to happy to be here, man. So let's ask this. Okay. So we ran into each other. I want to say, I think we trained last July. 
Okay. Now yeah. we've run into each other here and there since there, but last July, there was kind of this moment where I was like, Hey man, what's next for you? And you were kind of like, I don't know. I don't know if it's fighting. I don't know what it is. And I thought to myself, okay, cool. If you want to step away from this whole world, you can go somewhere else. You can do somewhere else. That's perfectly fine. Mm -hmm. But it is so hard to tell that part of your brain that loves doing it, we're not going to do it again. So how did you come back to fighting again? Yeah, no, it was tough, man. Um, you know, I fighting was always like a in the meantime type thing for me, you know. Um, obviously, I enjoy doing it. I love training with a passion. I love training. Um, I mean, you have to. If you're going to do this stuff, you have to love it. But... Uh, I just had some other opportunities in my life kind of open up and I wasn't sure if I was going to take those spots or if those, if those spots were going to open up for me in time. And, uh, so it just seemed like there was another window to take another fight again. And so I was, I was feeling it and I was like, okay, we're going to do it and we're going to do it my way. So I took a different, took a different weight class, changed up some things around in my camp. And, uh, yeah, it was just, it was really, really nice. And it was a great camp. Everything was great no injuries, no nothing going into it. And the, the recipe kind of, it all came together for in one night and um, yeah, probably my best performance ever. So I'm really, really proud of it. And you should be because it's easy to have uh, ring rust or cage rust. So it's also easy to be like, Hey, you come off an L your confidence can be shaken. Mm -hmm. So there's a little bit of overcoming that. But what's been good to see on the other side is since then, you've also been doing some jujitsu competitions. You've been doing some other stuff. And it always makes me wonder, like, in your brain, though, why? Like, why do you come back at a time where you have other things going on? You could easily say, I'm going to step aside. So when they did offer it to you, or did you seek it out? Like, how did those two things go? Yeah, no, I, um, well, I'm under contract with A1 Combat and they've been great. They're awesome. Um, the thing was, they, they didn't have any shows planned for Southern California and we were kind of looking for a fight pretty quickly and they were like, oh, you can come up north, but just like, you know, everybody that's fought MMA pretty much knows the money isn't great, you know, with starting out. So a lot of it has to come down to ticket sales. And luckily I have my dad and my support system that just go absolutely crazy when it comes to that. So I'm able to make a decent amount each fight and um, along with sponsorships. And so, yeah, we we talked to them. They said, yeah, we're not going to be coming down. You come up north. I'm like, hey, well, that doesn't really make a whole lot of sense. And they gave us the green light, which is they didn't have to do that. But they gave us the green light to fight for lights out. And so we took a fight with Lights Out, and they offered us a few opponents. We said yes. They said no. And then finally we had one guy say yes. We had like five weeks out. I'm like, okay. So we just got to work. And, um, yeah, my, my team did a good job. Everybody showed up, and they – I'm the only guy that really fights MMA out of my gym, and everybody comes together. And if I have a fight, we all have a fight. So um, shout out to Ace Jiu-Jitsu for coming together. And it's really It really is a team thing over there. So – I appreciate everybody. And yeah, I mean, I had a lot of people say that They're like, Oh, the confidence, the confidence is back, you know, after the win, but the confidence came back after maybe during the camp, really, you know, um, I was training at a couple of different gyms and I was just feeling really good, feeling better than I ever felt. And yeah, when, I mean, we'll, we'll talk about it more, I'm sure, but I was more calm going into this fight than I ever was. And I thought I was going to be more nervous than ever, especially coming off a loss. And, uh, but I was just, I was just calm and I was at peace with everything. And yeah, it was really weird. I think my coaches were a little concerned at how calm I was, <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, no, it was, it was nice. It was a really nice experience actually. I know you're a competitive person. Mm -hmm. How much did you need to win in this particular scenario? Because what's weird to me is this, we're in a sport where we overemphasize losing mm -hmm. where it's like, Oh my God, this boxer lost. They're trash. They're terrible. But I think it's part of the process. I think it's also what helps us get growth. Mm -hmm. So it's very strange to me. when We watch casuals talk about records when to me, I was like, well, this is really the first major loss for you. It shouldn't define you, but to you as somebody who's competitive, I'm not sure you think that way or that you are that way. So in your head, was there a need to be like, yeah, I got to get this W here? No, yeah, that's, um, 
Yeah, that's a really good question. I, you know, I had done all these camps before my before my last fight, not this past one, but the one before that. I had won every single one. You know, I put all the work in for super long camps. And I remember after every single fight, I was like, I cannot imagine doing all of this work, cutting the weight, doing everything right for 10 weeks, 12 weeks, doing every, doing all that and not winning. That, that part like crushed me. I was like, mm -hmm. I can't, I can't imagine that. And then when it happened and it happened the way that it happened, I was like, you know, I knew I was going to be back in the cage one day. I don't know if it was going to be in a year, if it was going to be in six months, if it was going to be in 10 years. I, didn't, I, didn't, I had no idea. But I knew I was still going to train. And I know that there's like, I don't, I don't like saying there's people that look up to me because I think that's weird. But um, I know there's a lot of people that look at me and they, you know, before, before that fight, they saw someone who was like, oh, he's walking to the cage. Like, you know, he's going to win. You know what I mean? Like that's, and... So to see me lose, it's like, okay, but if I were to not come back, then what would that, what would that say about me? You know what I mean? Like he lost a fight and he never came back. Um, so I knew that I was going to fight again and the opportunity just came up and I was like, okay, let's do it. And the whole, the whole camp, I was like, okay, you don't want to feel that feeling that you felt the last fight, you know? And there was no really regrets so much with the last camp. It was just more like, I know there's things that I could do better. You know, it wasn't, I wish I did this. It's like, okay, now we learn from that. Now we're going to do it like this. And the, the, the end result was, was pretty good. But, um, but yeah, I knew I had to, I needed to get back out there. I had actually seen a guy at the world league tournament that I did who I, um, I had fought against before. And, um, you know, I had just, I had just won the tournament. I was in, I was on like a, I was pretty excited because I had like five fights and like five submissions, you know, so I was really excited. And it was the first Nogi submit Nogi competition that I had won. And um, and he came up to me, he was like, Oh yeah, you know, congrats, man. He goes, Hey man, I saw your last fight, you know, but it's okay, we'll be back. And then I was like kind of annoyed that he like brought it up. But you know, I, I had knocked that guy out cold too. And um, <laughs> and I was just kind of annoyed that he brought it up like that. But for me, it was he and he hadn't fought again since. And I was like, Well, the difference between me and you is that won't be my last fight. You know, I'm going to have another one. It was, it's not going to be, I'm not going to end on that. That's not going to be the last time people see me in a cage is me, you know, on my back like that. So, um, every single time, some days I wanted to like not get up for training for this camp, you know, just cause that's just how it is. Training's hard. <laughs> um, but I was like, you know, you don't want to, you don't want to feel it. You don't want to leave any, any regrets, you know? So, um, yeah, I knew I had to get back in there and I didn't know it was going to be like that, but I'm glad it went like that. So let's let's go to my perspective here, which is I think you know me well enough to know I have met a number of fighters. We're friends with a number of fighters. I have heard them say, I'm going to come back. And sometimes they don't. And to me, I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. I think every person has to figure out what works for them. Mm. Like if you are going to come back and get more fucked up, it's not worth our time. Yeah. But we sat here back in July, this very gym, after a great amount of training. I did very well. You did okay. And at the very end of it, I just remembered you saying, I'm going to come back and fight. And you just said the same thing. You're like, I don't know where or when, but I see myself fighting again. So to me, when somebody says that, I said, you know, sometimes that means you have to go and do your career for a little bit. And then we'll see you in three, four years. Yeah. The hard part in my heart that I know is you don't get youth back. And so I'm like, well, I hope he makes this decision sooner than later. Mm -hmm. And lo and behold, the beginning of 2024, the end of 2023, I see the first signs of you starting to look like you're going to show back up. And I think to myself, uh-oh, this dude is coming back right now. Mm -hmm. So to me, what did that mean to you when you were kind of saying that? Yeah, I mean, it was, um, sorry, I got a little distracted. Yeah, I know. <laughs> so just so people are aware, there is an alarm that may go off here. So my apologies. Uh, we are working to make sure it does not. Anyway. It may go. Disarmed. Oh, we did it. Hey, hey. <laughs> some little behind the scenes magic for yeah, you. Right that kind of distracted me. I'm sorry. I'll give you the question. <laughs> oh, we're <going> to repeat <laughs> it. So I was saying, you and I talked about it. Yep. A lot of people... They say they're going to do it. Some people do, some people right. don't. And it's not necessarily a bad 
thing if they do not. Mm -hmm. For you personally, though, how much were you willing to like wait? Like, what were you willing to say? Like, what in your head when you were telling me that back Mm -hmm. in July? What were you thinking? Was it going to be the beginning of this year or was it going to be like two, three years down the line? Yeah, I mean, I wanted it to be sooner rather than later because exactly for the reason that you said you don't get youth back. And I knew that I felt good. I knew that that last performance was, you know, my worst performance. I knew that I didn't feel like how I normally feel when I'm in there. Um, And I knew I could do better than that. Mm. So, yeah, I wanted it to be sooner rather than later. I honestly, to be honest with you, I didn't think it'd be that soon, um, but I'm glad it was. And when uh, did you think it was going to be? If that's the case, because to me, you have to understand going from July from like hanging out with one of your boys and being like, yo, how's it going, man? Is everything good? Yeah. I don't know, man. Somewhere down the line, I'll see you fighting again. And then all of a sudden cut to the new year and I go, this motherfucker, yeah, yeah, yeah. like it's barely a new like season cycle. Like, bro, there's been a, a new season of stranger things. We've all been waiting for longer than your last yeah. fight. So what are we looking at here, man? Yeah, no, I, yeah, I thought it was going to be like maybe three years, something like that. Cause hmm. I wanted to, I had like another job opportunity. I thought that was going to open up. I thought I was going to do that for a little bit, put some money aside, do a really good camp and then do a fight. Um, but I had a lot of support. I mean, I, that was the other thing I was worried about. I was worried about a lot of, like a lot of people, you know, they see my fight like that and they're spending a lot of money, you know, to come watch me fight. Some people are spending, I mean, my cousin, my cousin, he, cousin Colin, he bought like the whole first row. Like those are like 120 bucks. Oh, wow. Yeah. A, a seat. <laughs> and that dude bought the whole first row as soon as it went on sale. And he's like, I know people are going to want these. And so, um, yeah, I mean, the support system that I have and they really picked me up and kind of gave me the confidence to, to go in there and do it. And, uh, I mean, I felt really bad because like, I didn't even really tell like, my mom because I kind of let somebody else tell her. But they, my, my grandma, too, she was, like, you know, in Spanish. But she was, like, you know, you're not going to do that again, are you? You know, like, that was the last one. And I was, like, no, nah, I'm going to probably do another one, but I don't know when. <laughs> and so I didn't tell her. And then so – and I hadn't seen her for a while. I showed up to Super Bowl, which was a week before my fight. And I was, like, all skinny. Like, my cheekbones were, like, you know, popping out. And so um, she was, like, oh, you're doing another fight, huh? And I'm, like, yeah. <laughs> so um, but I so wait a minute. Her, so you didn't tell your grandma until – just like a couple weeks before your fight? Probably, yeah, a week before, yeah. I mean, I'm sure she knew, but I didn't say anything to her because I didn't want her to like... Well, what about your mom then? No, How did mom, your mom, mom find out? I think my mom knew. Again, I didn't tell her that I was going to fight again, but I think she kind of knew. And so the other thing I told, I kind of figured was, I'm not going to do another fight if I'm not completely into it. Yeah. You know, I'm not going to... You You cannot walk into the cage if you're like half-assing it. There's no way it's not going to go well for you. It's too much of a risk. Like you have to be dialed in. So, um, and I told him the whole time, like every single time I would be like, Hey, I'm feeling really good. Like mm-hmm. really, really good and better than I've ever felt before. And so, you know, that last fight was the last fight. You know, this is this fight now. And so we learned from it. We, we fixed everything and hopefully we get a good result, you know, cause anything could happen in there, but yeah, it was, uh, they were, they were worried, of course. They're always worried. I remember I was walking out to the cage, and I looked at my mom, and she was like this. So, um, you know, I know she was still worried. I know a lot of people were worried. My coaches were nervous, I could tell. I mean, they, let's be honest, though. Most moms, that's their de facto most go-to. Moms, I feel like they don't even show up. You know, I feel like it's too it, much for It them. depends. It, it really does, because I remember, God, I want to say years before I was doing jiu-jitsu, I think my mom was like, finding out that one of my mutual friends was doing wrestling. And she's like, mm-hmm. oh my God, I could never see that that dude doing wrestling. Mm-hmm. And then I want to say a few years later, I was doing jiu-jitsu and she's like, what? And I was like, yeah. She goes, I could never see you doing that. And I was like, you know, it's weird, but it works for me because, mm-hmm. and I would explain to her, I was like, you can kind of use your brain here. Mm-hmm. And I go, and I think you're thinking like, these guys are all savages. They're crazy. They're super strong. They are but there's ways you can beat them. And I think that's a fun puzzle. And she was just like, okay, I kind of get it. But I definitely remembered shocking her because she was like, you didn't do wrestling. You didn't do this. And I was like, well, yeah, but now I'm at a different point. I want to see what I can do. Yeah, no, it's, it's cool. It's, I think everybody should at least like try it, you know, for the most part, I feel like it's super helpful. It'll help you learn a lot about 
about yourself. It'll kind of, it's a really humbling experience. Even like for me, like I wrestled and, you know, I was okay. I wasn't like super great or anything, but I was okay. And then I really liked jujitsu. I love the submissions and everything. And so, um, and like, you'll get one humbling experience and you're like, okay, I get it now. And then you'll start to make some progress and then you'll get another one and you get some progress and you get another one it just keeps happening over and over and over again. So I feel like they never stop. Yeah. And so, but I think that's one of the nice things about it, you know, cause, and then you see some guys like at the, the top of the sport, like the top of the game, like Volkanovsky, you know, or <laughs> some of the greatest of the greats, they, they go down, you know, you see how they handle it. And it's like, you know, at one point we saw these guys as invincible, but it's like, nobody's, nobody's invincible. Yeah, but know? that gets back to my original point, which is people were watching Volkanovsky mm -hmm. and they had these comments where they're like, he's washed. Mm -hmm. He's not good anymore. And I go, well, dude, he had a very good run. That doesn't go away. Yeah, no. Yeah, yeah. And two, I think in my heart, I would have loved to seen him get some more prep time for his rematch against Islam. Yeah. Having said that, what I think people don't understand is that contract that they put for him had a much larger pay increase that you don't get if you don't have that fight. Yeah. So even though it was not favored to him, he was also not the champ and he didn't technically win that first fight. Mm. So he's at a negotiation disadvantage. Mm. But if he brings himself up with a better performance or a better contract, then at that point, going forward, he can always make at least that kind of show money. Yeah. So when people are talking this shit, I'm like, yo... You have to respect this man. This short king, this dude has done some of the impossible. And the fact that that first fight was as close as it was, mm -hmm. arguably even his fight that he should have won. You think about those things and you say, to then go against this guy and say, mm, washed. Yeah. I will tell you this. What's hard for me as a objective bystander is, I know that. So when I see you have this moment, I think to myself, I have to separate what I think is good for you, which is, I think you should still fight mm. from what you want. And it's always one of those things where I think the best thing you can do as a friend is say, fight if you want, mm -hmm. but no, that doesn't mean shit. Yeah. And those of us who really are appreciators of mixed martial arts, no, that doesn't go away. Mm. It's a one night thing, and let's see what happens on the second time. Yeah, um, I it definitely gave me a whole new perspective, you know, and um, especially after this fight, you know, I I think it definitely is my most satisfying win. You know, I had a lot of like hard fights, and and even my first pro fight was an absolute war. And uh, but when you experience the lows and how horrible they feel. When you win, dude, it is the best feeling because it really makes you appreciate it that much because you know it's hard. Like winning is hard. And um, especially, in a, like I said, like a sport like MMA or jiu-jitsu where there's so many ways to lose. There's like a new way to lose every single day, <laughs> yeah. you know. And like, you know, we'd be watching stuff like fights or anything like that. And it's like, I didn't even know you could do that. You know, yeah. I didn't know like that was possible, you know. And so... um it really just makes you appreciate it. You put all that hard work in and you're not, I was telling this to somebody the other day. I was like, you can go to work. You can be whatever. And you put the hard work in, you show up every single day. More times, more often than not, the, your boss is going to notice that. If you put on good performance compared to everybody else, your boss is going to notice that. You do that every single day. Fighting, you are not guaranteed that. You could put in all the work. You could be the hardest worker. You could show up every single day. You could be the first guy in and the last guy to leave. Of course, the chances that you're going to win and be successful are higher. The likelihood is higher. But you could go in there and you can get caught by some spinning back fist or, you know, the guy could take you down. You could pop your rib and, you know, it'd be done for the, the rest of the fight or whatever. And you're not guaranteed that. And then now your pay goes down because you didn't win. You Half of your money's not there. And it really is a, a tough life. You know, it's, it's, it's really, really difficult and... You know, like I look at, I, like I'm being br brutally honest here. I look at a lot of these guys, you know, and I'm like, this is, this is their only way. Mm -hmm. This is the only way there's, it's fighting or it is being homeless. And I'm like, I, as much as I want to 
be like that. It, it's just not like that. I'm never going to have the same burning fire, the same burning thing as those guys are, you know? And I'm just, I'm just being like completely honest with me because it's, there's a lot more avenues for things. And it doesn't mean that I don't like fighting. It doesn't mean that I don't like training. It doesn't mean that I can't be successful in this, but it's just when it comes down to it and it's the last round and you're bloody and it's, you know, it's going to be harder for me to find that, to dig deeper than it is for those guys. It's just the way it is. I think some people talk about the concept of not having a plan B, mm -hmm. that plan A has to work. The weird part about that is from that perspective mm -hmm. comes all of those horror stories that we hear. Those moments where you go, oh shit, that dude didn't have a day job. Yeah. Oh fuck, I'm worried about that guy. Or those fighters that you go, this is an amazing talent. He's had a couple bad breaks, mm -hmm. but in a sport that doesn't understand bad breaks, it just looks like he's a bad fighter. Yeah. So sometimes I tell people, I'm like, people get hung up on the record. I'm very much a, when I watch people, I just always think, especially if I'm photographing, like how did I feel when I was photographing them? Did I feel like they had good jujitsu? Did I feel like they had good striking? And that even if they didn't win, I take it away. And what I've always tried to do on these interviews is say, hey, by the way, I was paying attention to that fight. You didn't win, but I saw your boxing. That was a really good boxing exhibition from you. You weren't on the right side of the decision. Happens. Okay, great. One night, you see somebody with jiu-jitsu, you go, you got caught that night, but I've seen your improvements that you made in some missions, and I've seen you work on your jiu-jitsu, and tonight it showed. That doesn't happen at all the time. And I know that, but it, it, it upsets me in a way where it's just kind of like, I think it holds back what could be. Mm. It holds back those moments where you go, oh, fuck, you cost us this guy. Yeah, That guy was going to be so good, and maybe you didn't help but to get into his head. Mm -hmm. Maybe you didn't help into making them feel worse, but it is unfortunately part of the game. So I would like to ask this. Um, obviously, we find out you have this fight, and you get to February. Things are starting to turn. Things are going well. But now, when you are entering the fight, it's an interesting thing because some of the commentary, and shout out to our friends. This is not a disparaging you guys. So Blake, I love you. But a couple things happened on the commentary that kind of shook me. The first was them saying you got into a brawl. And when yeah. I saw on the commentary that they said you got into a brawl, I pay attention to a lot of stuff. But I go, did I miss something? Oh, shit. And I thought, I'm like, you're not the kid that gets into a brawl. And if you did, I think I would have heard about it. And I'm not saying I do this to everybody, but you're in the inner circle enough where I would be like, what the fuck were you thinking? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So instead, I just kind of, as soon as they said it, I went to go look at your social media and I go, you can get into a brawl. Yeah, Is something yeah. happening backstage? So what was your response when you heard that after the fact? Yeah, I was like, what? I didn't get into a brawl. What are you talking about? I, but I knew that there was a brawl. So I was like, oh, they probably just like got like the wrong name or something, you know, it's not their fault. They just heard there was a brawl. Somebody probably told them that it was me and you know, it's not, it's not their fault. It's one of those easy to make mistakes, like a simple mistake. Yeah. But because I was there to watch you and Albert in particular that night, you were the two I was looking out for the most on commentary. And when they're like, you got into a brawl. And I was like, I didn't even blame them at first. I go, Oh, was there something I didn't see? Yeah. Let me go check. This kid didn't get into a brawl. I think nobody got into a brawl. But then when you didn't get into a brawl, I just started thinking, I was like, did they take one look at this guy walking out and think like, yep, that's a troublemaker face right there. Look at that son of a bitch. He definitely started some shit at the weigh-ins. No, yeah. I mean, I <laughs> shout, out, shout out to Big Ace, you know, my, my coach. I feel like if I ever got into a brawl, it'd probably be, it'd probably be because of him, you know? <laughs> and Because he's always got my back, so always got his. But, um, <laughs> but yeah, no, he, uh, I just... I compete a lot. I don't compete as much as I used to because I kind of take these breaks because I do like a big fight, you know, but I do like to compete. And obviously I run the kids program there. So like I can't be getting into any brawls because, <laughs> you know, I'm supposed to be like an example, you know. So. I don't know about that. Have you seen most of uh, the mixed martial arts community? There are plenty of kids coaches that get into fights. Yeah. I mean, for me, for me personally, <laughs> I just feel like that would just be a bad look, you know. And so, um, 
<laughs> yeah, but I first time I saw that I was like, oh no, dude! Like so now someone's gonna go back and watch my fight, and they're gonna think <laughs> I got into a brawl or something. I mean, uh, you know. But I mean, it's okay. I guess later on, later on in life, when I go back and watch it, I'll probably be like, yeah, I did get into a brawl. Yeah, I, did. <laughs> I fucked him up twice. I like that you're gonna get a, like a street cred off of it. You're gonna yeah, be like, yeah, yeah, yeah. we 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 balled when the back. Uh, whole bunch of tables uh, got fucked up, and I beat the catering, and yeah, it really got fucked up, man. Yeah, man. Okay. Let's talk about the fight. Yep. So the other thing I wanted to bring up, part two of this. And I don't even think I dislike the commentary for saying this. Mm. It's just the juxtaposition of this statement and the reality mm. were very funny. The statement. Well, you know, Eddie Bernal is just a grappler, so he's got his work cut out for him. The reality. Oh, that grappler did just get a knockout. Yeah. In 14 seconds. I know that's not something you hear right away, but it's something that pinged to me where I go, oh, I can't wait for him to watch this. Because if for no other reason, just the like quick turnaround for you to go from, I don't know, I mean, Eddie, you're looking at the keys of victory here and yeah, it's looking not good on the striking for Eddie. Mm -hmm. And he got to win my knockout. Look at him. Good for him. Yeah, no, I mean, like my whole time, like, I'm going to be completely honest again, uh, but I, I never thought I would get a knockout with my hands. Mm -hmm. And it's not because I don't think I could hurt people. I don't think I can land, like, big shots because I have landed big shots and I have hurt people. Um, but I just feel like my ground game is so much better <clears throat> that I don't feel like the fight being on the feet long enough for me to not take someone down and like, beat them up. And I put so much work into, like, my ground game and – taking people down, wall work, like everything. And, um, but I did a lot of work on my boxing. Shout out to coach Mitch, Mitch Maeda. You're the man. Um, but, and we worked a lot on footwork and moving in and out and keeping my punches short. <clears throat> and, uh, yeah, so that was really nice. It was really nice to get that. Cause now like I have, I was talking to my buddy about it and I was like, man, I kind of have a win in every single possible way that you can win. <laughs> I'm like, that's, it's crazy. I got like a submission, a submission from my back. I got head kick knockout. I got knockout with my hands. It's like, you know, so um, <laughs> I'm like, that's kind of cool. So, but yeah, it was, it was a really, really nice feeling. I didn't expect it to happen. Um, but, you know, it's just the way things work out. I put so much work in with my hands. Like, I don't think people understand. I was like so much and <laughs> it was difficult, but um, all my sparring partners are in Master Toddies. You guys are the best. They, um, you know, they really helped me like work on my striking and really helped me like move around and give me some pointers. And so every single week I was just practicing something different. And it was pretty cool because um, Ilya Topuria fought the day after me and he was a, a fire that, you know, I, I loved watching that guy since he, you know, since he was getting into the UFC. And um, I love watching fighters, seeing what they do well. And his boxing is insane. It is. It's it is really so good. good. And he knocks people like out, like out, out. And the way he moves, he moves his head. He has a wide boxing base. He he doesn't take a whole lot of leg kicks. You know, he takes some, but you never see him get like chewed up like some of the other guys that are really good at boxers. And I was like, this is a guy that I need to watch. And so I was watching him a little bit. And a lot of the stuff that I was looking at and I was observing, I would go to my coach Mitch the next day and he would tell me to do stuff. And the stuff that he was telling me was exactly what I was watching mm. with Ilya. And I was like, oh my God. Like, okay. So I was just, I was watching Ilya Topuri fights all the time, like the way he moves, everything. And so to get a knockout and then to see him get a knockout the next day, I just thought was like the coolest thing ever. I was like, that guy helped me out so much. And just, it, it was awesome, man. Like, yeah, it was just super, super cool. Got it. You hate Alexander Volkanovsky. I got it, bro. It's all good, bro. Sorry. I'm going to go ahead and tell him that right now. Um, the reason I bring this up is because when you do see a knockout like that, it doesn't just manifest in those 14 seconds. There's a lot of work that goes into it. You just alluded to a bunch of that. What were the differences that, in your opinion, you were able to make from the performance that you had the last time that yeah. didn't result in the result you wanted to this time where you got the result you wanted in an incredibly short amount of time? Yeah. Um, I mean, last fight, um, I just 
the one where I lost, I felt like I had to get a knockout. Mm. Um, not gonna say why, <laughs> because it's it's not important. But people that are close to me know. But I felt like I had to get a knockout, and so I went out there, and it was there was no movement, there was no nothing. It was just going forward, and it just the technique and like I can tell you everything that happened, but I can, it's almost like I can tell you from somebody that was watching from the outside mm. because it didn't feel like I had control of like what was going on, like over my body. And, um, and I remember just like standing there and like, I remember getting rocked and like everything's going black and then waking up and seeing my opponent's two legs standing right in front of me. I'm like, well, the fight must still be going. So I got up and sure enough, the fight was going and I was like, okay, I got to try to like weather the storm here. And then, um, I remember <laughs> being against the cage covering up like, okay, Frank, Frank Trigg, it's okay. You can, you can step in now, you know? And like, <laughs> and so I was like, okay, I started fighting back, you know? And, um, so, but yeah, I, I didn't feel like I really had control of what I was doing. Like I'm trying to shake things out. I go, I went back to watch it, you know? And like, I'm trying to shake my body out, like trying to just kind of like enter my body is really the, the best way I can say it. And, um, and so like this fight, I went in and I was like, I walked into the cage and one of my buddies, Asa, who's probably watching this, so shout out to you, AJ. Uh, one of the questions he asked me before the fight, and we talked about this, he was like, what, is the, what does the canvas on the cage feel like? And I was like, you know, I, know, I don't really know, but I'll let you know. And so I got in there and I was so like calm and I was so tuned in that I was like, all right, I'll make sure I'll tell him that it feels like this. You know, it, it kind of feels mm -hmm. like a little rough. It doesn't feel like a normal mat, but yeah, I'll make sure I let him know. And I told this to a few different people, but I was like, I was standing there and I was kind of doing what a pilot does before he takes off. Okay. okay like the rudders work, the engines check. So I'm standing there and I'm like, looking, I'm like, okay, left pinky works, right pinky works. I can move my left leg like this, move my right leg. Like I got full control over everything. I'm in control. This is me. I'm here right now. I'm, this is the same me that walks, that woke up this morning and brushed my teeth, you know? And I feel like that's, that's a really good way to do things. I'm probably going to do that from here on out um, just because you get so focused on the moment. You train all this time for one night and you just want to, you just, you're looking at your opponent and you're like, oh my God, this guy's really about to try to fuck me up in front of my family right now. You know, but if you go in there, you just remember this is, you're just, you have full control over everything that happens, you know, and you don't, you don't because you don't really control the other guy because he could throw a big punch and land, but you don't, but you tell yourself that and it kind of gives you that calmness and kind of gives you that peace and, it definitely felt like that when I was in there. I can, I mean, I know the fight was so short, but um, I could tell you everything I was thinking from from beginning to end. I could tell you everything. And um, it's funny, my coach, um, anybody who's seen the fight, they see I rock him first with a short left hook and he kind of gets wobbled. And my coach, he tells me that afterwards he was in the process of screaming, don't shoot, because he thought I was going to shoot for a takedown, you know, because of course the whole plan was to take him down and knock him out or, or like ground and pound, knock yeah. him out, submit him. And, um, but I was so like there that I was like, I don't know if anybody's ever played Wii Boxing in here, or I'm sure they have, but like if you rock someone in Wii Boxing, like the punch kind of goes like slow and like everything kind of slows down. And it literally felt like that. I literally was looking at him and I'm like, this is like we boxing. That was my exact thought. I heard him and I'm like, oh my God, this is just like we boxing. And I just like loaded up on a right hand. I was like, I'm about to throw this motherfucker as hard as I can. And yeah, dude, it was just landing clean. It was the craziest feeling ever. But um, shout out to shout out to Jonathan Romero, dude, the referee. That was one of the best stoppages I've ever seen, mm. honestly. Like, especially knowing me and because everyone's like, oh, yeah, good job on Eddie Bernal for not following. Like, you guys don't understand what I was about to unleash right there. Like, <laughs> that was like 11 months of just of all that tension, all that, like, yeah. all those emotions were about to just come down. And, um, yeah, Jonathan Romero did a good job. And, yeah, it was really it was a crazy, crazy night. But, yeah, I, I definitely got to give my shout-outs to him because I will look back at that fight and I'm like, I don't know if I would have stopped it right there. Because in your head, anybody who's fought – knows like you have to go till the referee stops you you know and um i didn't i knew the guy was tough i don't think he'd been knocked out before um i know he'd been submitted but i don't think he'd been knocked out he literally won a fight one of the fights that we watched because he was like absorbing all the damage the guy got tired and then he, my opponent took him down and the guy covered up in half guard and he just like ground and pounded him until the mm. referee stopped it it was like that homer simpson thing where he's <laughs> boxing 
<laughs> you know, yes. and the guy's just punching him over and over and over again, and then he passes out because he's so tired. So, um, <laughs> this guy was tough, dude. And uh, yeah, kudos to him, man. He, that guy was a tough dude. And so, we just, I didn't expect it to go like that. I thought we were going to have to take him down because I, I thought I could hit him over the head with a steel chair and nothing would happen. <laughs> <laughs> well, fortunately, that didn't happen. Yeah. But I do like the fact that even out of the pocket, you're kind of like, hey, man. Um, thank you for making sure this fight didn't turn into a homicide. No, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, because I mean, I don't know. I knew he was tough, so I don't know if he was gonna hit the ground and like jump on my leg for a mm-hmm. single leg. You know, you don't know what's gonna happen in the situation. And um, but he he did an amazing job. Like that was, people think refing is easy. I, I mean, anybody who thinks that refing is easy should look at that fight and just be like, if you would have let that fight go one more. And, I personally, for me, I would have let it go one more, like thinking about it. Cause I'm like, you don't know if the guy's going, how many fights have we seen? where like, oh yeah, you should stop that. And then they don't stop it. And the guy gets on a single leg. He recovers. Yeah. And he back and wins. I don't know, man. I, I felt pretty good about that stop. Oh, Cause I, I, I saw it and I yeah. just go, yeah, I think we're done here. Yeah. And I think it's because like you mentioned that initial hit that you hit first, you said a hook, right? Yeah. The hook it stunned him, mm-hmm. and then it was the follow-up that I go, oh, so I think we did either a fight companion or something here. <laughs> and one of the kids was like, hey, what's going on, coach? And I was like, yeah, I'm in a good mood. They're like, why? I was like, well, one of my friends won. We just arranged we're going to do one of these. And they're like, well, what happened in the fight? I was like, well, I can show it to you. Mm-hmm. And they go, what do you mean? I go, I can show you the whole fight. And they go, that's a good thing. And I go, it's a very good thing. I go, My guy won, got out quickly. I go, but look at this fight. They look at it. This is a young student. Mm -hmm. He's just like, yeah. Yeah, it's a good job, coach. And I was like, I didn't do shit. This is all him. And the way that he's reacting to it was enough to tell me, you know, there's a universality to mixed martial arts where people don't know you, but they want to see the knockouts. And they want to be like, show me what it is. And then they see it and they go, yeah, that dude's fucking cool. And I go, well, it was always cool. It was just, you know, this is a cool thing that happened to a buddy who was already awesome. And he looks at it and all of a sudden, uh, you know, I'm setting up all these cameras and all this stuff. And he goes, yo, coach, coach, show him that footage. And I go, let me do this first. I will be happy to show you guys this footage. So even there, the boys here were like, oh, shit. They're like, you're interviewing? I was like, yeah, yeah, he's a friend. I was like, you know, he's easy to submit. But it's not (laughs) really for me to say here. So they were laughing and they were enjoying it. But... I just thought, look at the amount of joy that brings the people who don't know you, mm-hmm. that they were just like, yo, that's so sick. Like they internalize it in their brains. Like if that happened to me, I'd be so happy too, mm-hmm. or I would have come through this or I would have felt this. So it was a, a universal feeling. What did the celebration look like, sir? Yeah. Um, it was, it was cool. I was, it was difficult because for me, it was like a big weight was lifted on my shoulders because, again, I was coming off of a loss. And so, obviously, a lot of people still came out to, like, support me. And um, and I thought I was I was really surprised when I walked out and how many people I saw out there, you know, because we only sold tickets for, like, five weeks because that's when everything got finalized. Again, coming off of a loss, people... People are probably like, oh, okay, you know, spent all that money last time. He didn't win, you know, maybe we could just watch it on TV, you know, which I understand. I, I don't, I don't blame them at all. And, um, the venue is kind of hard to like get into. There's not a whole lot of parking. I know a couple people like, got towed last time. And so, <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I, I, I get it, man. And, um, but it's just like all of those feelings of walking back into, cause that's the venue where I lost and I lost bad, you mm-hmm. know? Mm-hmm. And I had a friend who fought there, a friend that you know, and it didn't go well for him either. And um, so you walk in and all you know is like bad things have happened here. Mm-hmm. It's very eerie. It's a very eerie feeling. And you walk out there, you walk onto that stage and like, man, last time I was on the stage, I walked down there and I got finished, you know? And so to win like that, I was on top of the cage and I was almost, it was, there were, I wasn't smiling. Even afterwards, everybody came in, I wasn't smiling. I was like pissed off. And I wasn't pissed off at anybody. I was more pissed off at like myself because it's like, you were so hard on yourself for all this time. For the past like 10 or 11 months, you were so hard on yourself. You were like, 
you you didn't want to even go back to teach the kids striking class because you got knocked out you know and you you were so self-conscious i couldn't dude i couldn't even watch like ufc fights without thinking about like my loss mm. i see a guy get finished i'm like damn that's like what happened to me you know and um it was just because i was one of those casual mma fans for a long time you know you see a guy get finished like oh man that guy got worked you know but um i so i was i was angry afterwards really for a little bit i was i was like screaming out in the crowd like you got like thinking that they doubted me but they didn't it was really just me and so everybody was going crazy like i saw one of these um one of the videos that one of the parents took it's probably my favorite video of out of all the angles because it's so far away mm. you could see everybody like jump up all the arms go up and everything and my buddy colin who i'll mention again he was sitting right in the front and he was sitting right next to the walkout and so this is a great story he um he loves my walkout song i walk up to the same song pretty much every single time God's gonna cut you down by Johnny Cash. Great song, and he 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 loves it. And so, um, so I was walking out. He's right there, and he's probably like from me to you as I'm hugging my coaches, and he's like, "Cut him down, Eddie. Cut him down." And that's where I went from like serious to like, "Oh, let's fucking go." I was like, "Let's fucking go." He had like his Oakleys on, like the big mm -hmm. like I wear them too, the big Oakleys with the big blue lenses, you know. He's like, "Cut him down, Eddie," and I was like. I was like, come here, get yeah, fucking dapped him up. You know, I was like, let's do this. <laughs> and so from there afterwards, man, like, so, so the video, you can see after I knock him out, right from where Colin is sitting, you see a margarita go flying like 20 feet in the air. <laughs> and then like probably 10 seconds later, you see like my hat that one of the team Bernal hats also go flying up in the air. <laughs> and so you just see everybody going crazy. And, um, and my cousin Omar, who also holds pads for me all the time. He's he's the man, dude. He helps me a lot with my boxing. And um, he is margarita also went flying up in the air. There's just it was raining margaritas over there. And so it was just crazy. And so afterwards, once I started seeing the look on everybody's faces, I started to like calm down and be like, okay, we can relax a little bit now. We can we can have fun here. So um yeah, it it was cool. I was I was hard on myself, but afterwards, and like I guess like afterwards, my buddy AJ. Um, he, he was watching and he was like, you almost look like angry. Did something happen? Like in the cage afterwards when like my dad was giving you, um, your shirt to put back on. Cause you look like mad. And I was like, well, I was so calm the whole day and I was in the back and I was telling everybody how calm I was mm. and how, how nice this feels to like be this calm. And my coach Asa was like, well, you have to remember, man, it's still a fight. And I was like, well, I mean, I know that my, my gloves are taped up you know yeah, yeah, i know but i was i just and i could tell he was kind of getting a little bit worried and even before we walked out he like like yelled he was like ah and i've never heard him do that before and i could tell that he was nervous you know and so i was telling i was like i, I was tell i told you man i told you i was calm the whole day i told you i was gonna have a good performance the camp was good everything was good i told you i told everybody i told everybody this is what happens. And so, um, but yeah, it was, it was great. Afterwards, we went and got pizza. Shout out to me and Ed's pizza. <laughs> super, super good. You guys are awesome. They, I felt bad for these people um, because I don't know what time they normally close, but they didn't, we didn't get out of there till like 1230. And I think they normally close at like 10. And so they all stood late for me. And, um, but super, super awesome. Every, a lot of people stayed like really late and, um, yeah, it was cool. The celebration's still going because I still there's still a lot of people I haven't seen yet, and the mm. first time I see them, they're like, "Oh yeah, dude, I watched that." Like last <laughs> ni last night, dude. My dad, <coughs> excuse me, my dad. He sent me a message. Somebody, so one of his friends was at a bar, and on one of the TVs last night they had a fight playing, and he's like, "Oh, I think I know that guy." And like, oh my God, he pulls out his phone oh, and records a random bar in Monrovia, <laughs> like two weeks later, had my fight playing. So there's all these people in the bar and you can hear them because they don't know. They think the fight's live. Mm. They go, oh, you heard him. Oh, and it's the same organic reaction all over again. And I'm just like, that's crazy, dude. Like some bar has, some random bar that has no idea who I am, just has my fight playing. And people saw, people are still watching this, you know? And um, it's just, it's, it's crazy. And I don't know. I never thought it would happen, but it did. So 
Yeah, it's a really good feeling. The celebration has been awesome. There's still a lot to do, though. Obviously. Yeah. So, okay. Celebration goes great. Obviously, things go well. I'm glad that you have turned a corner on being able to leave a part of that for yourself because that rock that you put on yourself was not the same rock that anybody else in that audience felt because that's why they come back. They want to see you. They want to see you succeed. And I think they know you're capable of success. It's just in your head. You're like, why are you guys here? I got knocked out in the last one. Fuck you guys. Ah, shit. It's hard to explain that to people when you put all that pressure on yourself and they're not in the cage. So they don't get to share that burden. Mm -hmm. What they get to share is, hey, I'm here for you. And so you, your family has always shown out. They always uh, mob out to this. I mean, I could hear them, hear them loudly. And I even told my wife, I was like, you're going to hear his crowd. Like knowing Eddie, his father, they're going to bring this shit. It's going to be intense. And it was great to hear. Having said that, I do get curious on a couple things because you get a win like that. Mm. What does that mean for the future? Because to me, I look at you and I think, cool, you have momentum now. Mm -hmm. Maybe things come up in your side of the world. Mm. Maybe you take that time off. What in your head are you envisioning next? Yeah, I mean, it's it's tough to say. Um, obviously, after you get a win like that, you don't take a whole lot of damage. And um, But there's so much that goes into camps and everything. Like, There's a lot of stuff that you miss. <clears throat> when it comes to like family things and like we have a lot of big family stuff coming up this year you know like a couple weddings in like Cabo and um I never even been to Cabo before so um you know there's a lot of big <clears throat> family stuff that's going to be happening and stuff that I don't want to miss um so yeah I don't know we'll see what happens I just know the next fight I'm going to do if I do another one um is going to be big and um so, yeah, we'll see what happens. But regardless, no matter what, I'm going to keep training because that's what I love to do. Mm. <clears throat> I'll probably do a little more grappling, do more um, grappling competitions. Um, maybe some like grappling, like super fights and things like that. That'd be cool. But, yeah, I, I really have no idea what's next. It depends kind of what opportunities present themselves to me. But I'm not closing the, the door on fighting at all. I'm still going to be training. Like I have a fight. That's always how I train. I always train for something. Um, but... Yeah, we'll I was just laughing because when we had this discussion going back to July, you and I here having good rounds, enjoying stuff. There's this moment that I distinctly remember thinking, okay, maybe he's going to take a break from fighting. Maybe we get him on the jujitsu side for a little bit because I know your jujitsu well. Mm -hmm. And I think to myself like, oh, dude, we don't, we don't get to see this this often. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe you compete every once in a while, you know, but it's so fun to watch that I think like, yeah, dude, live your life, do whatever you're doing. But like, man, it, it's such a good thing. You, you, you want to keep that momentum going. Mm -hmm. And then here I see, I'm like, well, we'll see where he comes out. We'll see what he figures out next. And then all of a sudden you're like, oh, I'm fighting again. I was like, this motherfucker's not going to get to grapple in a bit. Uh, all right, fine. We'll let you go on out and do what you need to do. Mm -hmm. But I am, I am warned by knowing that you are going to continue always training jujitsu and training striking. But to us, I'm like, I don't even think we've seen uh, the scratch surface of what you can do as a grappler. So uh, selfishly from a show titled The Grappling Hour, yeah. it would be nice to see you get those super fights and stuff like that. Because I've, I've always felt like your style matches up well against a number of guys. So it's only a matter of seeing like, hey, maybe put you up against this guy or this guy or this guy. And kind of letting that kind of play out. So just know that that's something that I'm kind of like, even as you're like, I don't know, maybe I fight, maybe I don't. I'm like, this motherfucker better show up at some super fights yeah, or yeah. at least go show up um, some great grappling competitions because <laughs> I just love that in passing, you and I were talking about it. I think there was one tournament and we were like, are you doing this? Are you doing that? I was like, I don't know. And you're like, I don't know. And I go, oh, I've got the worst person to talk to about this because I'm like, I think he's just as indecisive as I am. I'm like, I don't know, man, if I'm free, we'll see. We'll see what I'm up to that week. So... Uh, just our, our little way of passing. I would be remiss if I didn't say that when we put up questions to the audience, we did solicit some. Mm. And we were given uh, a couple questions. Oh boy. 
Okay. This one comes from Colin White. Oh, boy. And it says, Ask Eddie Bernal why he hasn't had his name on the Monopoly Championship board since February of 2022. Yeah. Um, there's there's a good reason for that. Um, it, maybe it's because every time they play is when I'm not there. Mm. Um, they want to get some other names on the board. That's fine. Um, it could also be because I'm too busy winning this. You can go ahead and zoom in on that. I don't know if you can, but it's a uh, fantasy football championship ring right here. So <laughs> wait a second. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I'm just, I want to make sure people understand what's happening here. Why do you have this ring and what does it mean? What does yeah. it symbolize here, sir? So this, this symbolizes much like my, my last fight coming back from adversity. I started off <laughs> my uh, fantasy football league. zero and four, you know, but we bounced back and we made playoffs. And the guy who asked that question, Colin, I actually defeated him twice. And uh, the second time was to destroy his dreams of making the playoffs. So, um, you know, I had my eyes set on bigger things, but Colin, don't you worry. I'm coming back and I'm going to get my name on that board and I'm going to get another one of these. Okay. So, so hold on, hold on. Let me ask this real quick. Is this the same Colin who has recently started doing jujitsu? Yes. Okay. Does he not understand that there are implications for making these kinds of statements when you have crossed over? Because I'll tell you this much. I think you know me well enough to know it. And I speak as a foremost authority of this. I a hundred percent talk trash to everybody, oh, yeah. but the difference is I say, come train with me. And I know there could be come up and that happens to me there. Mm -hmm. But what happens for me is I show up and I say, all right, do your worst. Let's see what happens. Do you think that Colin is going to do that with you now? Well, no. Um, <laughs> <laughs> at the end of the day, Colin's my, Colin's my boy. And, uh, yeah, we, we actually rolled for the first time. Okay. On, uh, on Friday, he um, he's a firefighter, mm -hmm. and um, I guess in June they have like the police versus fire like games and or jujitsu competitions, and so he wants to get ready for that. And so he came he came to me and he was like, "Hey, I know you're pretty good. You're pretty good at this jujitsu thing. I was wondering if you could like help me out." And I was like, "Yeah, dude, of course." And so as much as we joke around and we go back and forth, that guy has done so much for me, and so he has taught me a lot. So it's and I'm, I was really excited to be able to work with him and, and teach him something because I feel like I've never been able to teach him anything. And um, so it was super cool. But um, yeah, I I love working with him. It was really fun. I can't wait to do it again. Um, I won't say how the roles went because it doesn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> but I'll tell you what, I'll tell you what, for only training for, for less than a year, I mean, really, really solid, really, really good. And he's got he's got that dog in him, dude. Like okay. he, he really does. He's got that dog in him, and I'm excited to see how he does at this uh, at the the police versus fire games. Because when that guy puts his mind to something, man, he's except for fantasy football, of course. Because I kick his wow, ass. There, wow, wow. The the <laughs> the disrespect is heavy here. So, Colin, this is what I should uh, tell you. First of all, let's take a look at this this ring. I don't. You can't really zoom in on it too much here. But oh, what, he's seen it. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so for those of you guys who cannot read it, it says six pack league champs, the bottom feeders, which by the way, okay, if that's the name you're going with, but I want to point this out to you. If I had this ring yeah. and this dude was coming up and asking me for help, you have to understand there would have been a kiss the ring moment. There would have been, and you're a much better person than me, but there would have been a, Oh, you, you need some help for that, that major tournament. My son, <laughs> You know what you need to do. So the fact that you didn't do that to him, it shows that yeah, you are you are a kind and generous yeah, soul. I, I was just so excited, man. But he'll he'll kiss it soon. But uh, I was just so excited to <laughs> help him out, man. But yeah, I, I definitely everybody in the league will they'll, they'll be able to get a chance to. So uh, this is your first time doing fantasy football. You were yeah, saying, right? Yeah. How many times has Colin done fantasy football before? I don't know. I know he was in two leagues this year, which means it leads me to believe that he's done it in years past. Okay. So, um, did he win the other league that he was in? No. Oh, yikes. Yeah. Oh, it's yeah. not good for it's, him. It's all, it's all good. Oh. But, um, Colin, yeah, we gotta, actually, we gotta up those ranks, bro. I, I do have to shout out to Colin, though. I really do because he is a big reason why I won this league because I needed a running back and Colin had a lot of running backs and he needed a wide receiver. 
and I had a lot of wide receivers. So I traded him Amon Ross St. Brown for Joe Mixon. And it ended up being an amazing trade. Even though Amon Ra was like going crazy. <laughs> um it ended up being a great trade. So thank you, buddy. You're like wow. a big reason why I won this one. <laughs> so so thank you to you. Okay. He also followed up with this. Oh no. For real though, ask Eddie about the physical differences he felt fighting at 145 as opposed to 135 and how it affected his camp and his fight. Yeah, that was that was probably the biggest thing. And I I, I remember like going back. It's not so much cutting the weight. I mean, it is cutting the weight, but it's just like the toll that it takes on you mentally. It's like, there's so much more that goes into it. Like for me to make 135, everything needs to be like dialed in 100%. Mm. 145, of course, it needs to be dialed in too, but 135 really takes everything I got. And so there's a lot that goes on in my mind. It's like, it's really hard to find any enjoyment in life anywhere because I love food. I love like (laughs) drinking water. So, um, (laughs) you know, it just gets really difficult and it's, there's a lot of physical differences for sure, but I feel like the main thing is the mental side of it. And, um, I was just a lot happier this camp. And I was noticing too, like the two guys that I fought when I was 135 were, yeah, I was bigger than them, but they felt faster than me. They felt stronger than me. They, they felt like they had better cardio than me. I felt like in order for me to make 135, I needed to overtrain. And, and you kind of like justify in your head. You're like, okay, I did as much as I could today. But overtraining is a real thing. It mm. is a, I mean, when I was making 135 and like, keep in mind, like I, I'm not super experienced in like cutting weight. Like I know a lot of people think I am, but I'm not. I know people do like all the water loading and all that stuff. I I didn't have anybody around me like that to like tell me what to do. You know, I had people that told me like, okay, yeah, you want to eat this, this, and this. But as far as like the actual weight cut part itself, you know, it was, it was difficult. And so I was just trying to be a little bit lighter every single day. And, um, dude, I was running like five miles a night, Mm. you know what I mean? And I'm like, my legs were just exhausted. And when I was making 145, it was like, okay, this isn't weight loss camp. This is fight camp. You're training for a fight. You're not training to lose weight. You're going to lose weight in the process of it. And um, and I'm looking around. I was at these other shows, the A1 shows, and I'm looking at the 145ers. I'm like, these guys are the same size as me. Mm. You know, I don't need to be like this big. I need to have like energy. I need to get my skills right. And so it just gave me more time and more ability to focus on sharpening the tools, which is the most important part of a fight anyway. And so... Um, yeah, and I just felt so dialed in every single day of training. Not just the fight, every single day of training, I felt like, okay, I get to go train today. I don't have to wear sauna suits all day when I train, you know. Um, still have to work very hard to get to the weight, of course, but not so much where I'm hating life yeah. every single moment. And that's that's really the biggest thing. But yeah. Well, that's good, good to hear. Well, sir, listen. We have had a long day here. We have watched some fights. We have trained. We have eaten some pizza. And I feel like we have uh, spent a very good amount of uh, time together. But I wanted to tell you this. Part of the reason why I wanted to do this interview, not just to celebrate a great win. uh, I mean, it's a long discussion to have for like 14 seconds. But it's more the story behind it that I felt was so much more compelling. And I knew you being in the winner's circle had such a great story to tell and share to other people who maybe have experienced something that is similar or uh, can relate in whatever field that they want to. But knowing what I know, it is likely we see you fight. I just, I can't hold out on knowing that because that's really your decision. That's going to come up with whatever comes up in your life. And obviously we wish for the best, but what I'm so warmed by knowing is that you're going to be training. You're going to be doing great things. I I don't think we've seen the end of your competitive cycle. It's just a matter of if it ends up in a cage or ends up somewhere on a mat Mm -hmm. uh, in the near future. But nonetheless, uh, whatever the next steps are, I'm very glad that we have been able to continue doing these uh, interviews and that you are very much a a friend of the show for life. So you and I are going to be training forever. And I very much appreciate the way that you and I have been able to develop 
what I consider a friendship that has gone past what we do on these interviews. And uh, I just wanted to say thank you for that. And that uh, the training uh, very much, whenever we get to do them, it's always good to catch up with you and see what new things have happened with you, see what you're learning, see what new parts of your jujitsu game are there. So that's really not going to stop no matter what the next decisions are. But I have this aching feeling in the back of my mind somewhere that there's probably not an end of the series of interviews that we do because you're probably going to do something else. It's just kind of a matter of time. Mm. So in the meantime, uh, I want to do this. I want to put a pin in this conversation. I want to have you talk to that camera right there. And I want to have you say uh, any thanks or, or, or appreciation, shout out sponsors, whatever you want to do. But that camera is all yours, sir. All right. I just want to say thank you to everybody who's sponsored me, who's supported me through all the times. Um, Nunez Embroidery, doing my shorts, doing uh, the hats, everything. You guys are awesome. Me and Ed's Pizza for sponsoring and hosting our super late um, post-fight parties. Appreciate it. Um, um, I want to support, I want to thank a couple families um, super close to, especially my dad. They're close to our family, but especially my dad. They, um, my dad lost two really close friends to his um, Cesar Rodriguez and, um, and our neighbor James. And, uh, they were both <clears throat> amazing, amazing people. And it was very, very tough losses for, for my dad. And James is, uh, James's wife. She, James was a huge fan of mine, a very, very huge fan of mine. And I hadn't even really had that many conversations with him. He was very close with my dad in the whole neighborhood, but he tragically passed away in a very sudden uh, work accident. But that guy was always wearing my shirts everywhere, even before he even talked to me. He was wearing the Team Bernal shirts, everything. He was like, he, my dad had some posters made. He bought them. He still had them up in his, in his uh, wall. He wore the Team Bernal hat everywhere. And, um, and I remember when I lost my fight, I was so, I was in the back and I was, I didn't want to go outside to greet everybody, you know, and I was just so embarrassed. And he, he came into the locker room afterwards and he said, you know, he's like, you're the man, dude. And he's like, you, you know, we're all super proud of you. There's a lot of people out there still want to go out there and they want to, they want to be there for you. They want to take pictures for you. Like my kids look up to you. Like you're the man. I'll ride with you till the wheels fall off. And, um, so his, his wife actually sponsored me and gave me like, you know, just gave me some money, but she wrote me a, a very, very nice note. And it, I kept it in my bag with me right up until I walked out. And, um, those, just those two guys, the, the stuff that they, they were both great, great guys. And, um, you know, his wife didn't need to do that for me, but they were such big supporters and they were there for my dad and they were there for my family. And so, Seeing them, seeing those two families, you know, in the crowd, especially after everything they've been to or been through, it hasn't even been a year yet for either one of them. Um, just for them to support me and, and be there for me, I them along with everybody else for supporting me and coming out and buying tickets. I cannot express to you guys how much it means to me, and um, I just appreciate it more than you know. So shout out to everybody who bought a ticket or supported me or anything. So and shout out Ace Jiu Jitsu and Tim Carmel all day. Good man. Well, let's put a button on this. I'm going to go ahead and do the plugs here for my stuff. Thank you guys so much for watching. I appreciate you guys. I hope that you've enjoyed this episode. I think it's a good episode. And more importantly, I hope that if you made it this far, like, comment, and subscribe. And now, if you have no idea what to comment on, first of all, there was a lot to really comment on. But the second thing is, if you were rolling with Eddie and you were trying to get under his skin, what is the one thing you would say to him? to try and uh, unnerve him, to try and get out of it. Because I'm going to take those things, and if one of them is really good, I may say it the next time we roll. So I'm just saying in the comment section of this YouTube video, feel free to go ahead and put that underneath there. Number two, if you like this show, not just a like, comment, and subscribe, you can also do more than just that. You can head on over to rafasparza.com backslash merch. You can get this right here, this Grappling Hour t-shirt. It comes in five different colors. You can also get my man over here sporting the Grappling Hour. Well, bro. <laughs> bro, let's not pretend like you actually have like that kind of like stack. You ain't, you ain't on steroids right now, no, fam. No, no, no.
that wait till I turn. <laughs> wait. <laughs> I was like, bro, we found out tonight. I was like, this motherfucker is going to be on steroids by 35. I already know it. But if you want to go over to raffasparson.com backslash merch, you can get these hoodie t-shirts. They are a combo at 60 bucks. Otherwise, 25 here and 45 over here. So we appreciate you guys for giving us the love and support. Also, do us a solid. We're on Patreon. So it's patreon.com backslash grappling hour. If you go on over right now, five bucks a month, you see these interviews 30 days before anybody else. And for a few extra dollars, you can see our premium content that includes bonus episodes. So that means mini sods, tape studies with the athletes watching their fights back. We would have done one tonight, but this motherfucker did it in 14 seconds. And in good faith, I couldn't charge you extra for that. So I try to think here, people. Now, Having said all that, if you want to do that, you can also see a segment that's called Roast Rap where people roast my competition footage. So there is that. And uh, I guess the last one is join our Discord. So all those things and more. Uh, Eddie, my appreciation to you. You are certainly the man, even though I did take you down twice today. So there is that. It's fact that happens. I just want to make sure we put that on the public record. And I think that's a good time to end the show. It's been a great day for grappling. We'll see you back at the mats. Perfect.